Good afternoon from the Global Impact Investing Network in New York. My name is Mabinti Karoma Moore, the Engagement Manager on the GINS, IRIS, and Impact Measurement and Management Team. Thank you for joining today's webinar, Examining Impact Measurement and Management with an SDG Lens. We aim to understand how investors are contributing to the SDGs and really what does it mean to align to the goals. To understand the impetus for IMM with an SDG Lens, we will get the investor's perspective on why they're investing in the SDGs and their approaches to measuring and managing impact. Since the announcement of the SDGs, the GIN has been monitoring investors' asset allocations to the, to the goals, as well as the need to reduce fragmentation and align approaches to IMM is highlighted in the GIN's recent report, The Roadmap for the Future of Impact Investing, Reshaping Financial Markets. So here's what we'll cover. In response to investors' demand, we conducted a comparison between IRIS metrics and the SDG indicators and targets. We will hear from two different investors, PGGM and Partners Group, and open our chat function for Q&A. Before we jump in, let's go over some housekeeping. Please mute all lines. Our Q&A will be held at the end of the webinar through our chat function. The deck and a recording of today's webinar will be posted on our website, www.thegin.org research. For questions about today's content, we ask you to go to our website, www.iris.thegin.org, or contact us via email at iris.thegin.org. So we have a dynamic group of speakers today, and we are delighted to have Adam Helster. Adam Helster is the Head of Responsible Investment at Partners Group, a Switzerland-based private markets investment manager. Adam began his career in the development aid industry, focused on infrastructure and agribusiness, with a specialty in post-conflict zones like Iraq, South Sudan, and Southern Philippines. Before joining Partners Group, Adam was a global leadership fellow at the World Economic Forum, where he built partnerships between multinational agribusinesses and leading international NGOs like Oxfam and Greenpeace. Thank you for joining us, Adam. We are also delighted to have Pete Klopp, who leads PGGM's company and marketing engagement efforts around water scarcity. He is also developing PGGM's 20 billion euro investing in solutions portfolio, including impact me measurement. Before joining PGGM Investments in July 2011, Pete was at the World Resources Institute in Washington, D.C., where he initiated the Water Risk Atlas Aqueduct and held senior positions at the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the private sector. As water resources expert, he worked at the World Bank and the United Nations. Thank you for joining us, Pete. Last but not least, we have my colleague, Adam Dolan. As an associate of the GIN, Adam focuses on advancing the state of impact measurement and management practice through standards development, solving for fragmentation and approaches, and creating useful entry and exit points for different actors along the capital chain. His work experience includes managing the interoperability of IRIS across metric sets and building the Impact Toolkit, an online database designed to connect users to relevant impact measurement and management resources. With that, let's start with Adam Dolan. Thanks, Mabinti. I'll use the next few slides to provide a quick primer on IRIS before jumping into how the SDGs and IRIS work together. IRIS has been managed by the GIN since 2009 and contains the generally accepted performance metrics that leading impact investors use to measure and manage social, environmental, and financial success, evaluate deals, and grow the sector's credibility Similarly, IRIS is designed to work for any type of investor, whether you're a small asset manager with a homogeneous portfolio or a large asset owner with a diverse portfolio. 
Here's a snapshot of the different types of organizations that use IRIS. The diversity of organizations here is illustrative of the varying use cases for the system. According to the GIN's December 2017 survey on the state of impact measurement and management practice, it found that 62% of respondents use IRIS. Given the GIN's overall effort to reduce fragmentation and approaches to impact measurement and management, this figure presents an opportunity for the market, and it's where IRIS linkages come into play. So linkages are activities in which we connect the so-called alphabet soup of metrics, assessment tools, and methodologies to IRIS. By harmonizing IRIS with these other tools and frameworks, we're reducing fragmentation and approaches and moving the impact investing industry to a future with interoperability of impact data and a greater understanding of impact performance. With this in mind, I'll talk a little bit about the SDG IRIS linkage as it is somewhat different from our previous IRIS linkages. The SDGs are neither a straight ahead metric set, assessment tool, or methodology, but rather an internationally accepted set of goals, targets, and indicators guiding the global development agenda through 2030. Knowing the widespread appetite for impact investors to contribute to the SDGs, as well as the widespread adoption of IRIS, we conducted an initial exercise to assess how IRIS metrics work with the SDGs, which kicked off an iterative process as we pursue our fifth update of IRIS to be released in 2019. In building this out, we learned from other similar efforts across the field, including Tonix and the DNB working groups. To do this linkage, we aligned IRIS metrics to the 230 indicators contained within the SDGs, which are marked in the red box on this slide. As IRIS metrics sit primarily at the organizational output level, the SDGs indicators, which identify measurable outcomes, albeit at the country level, are the component that connects the closest with IRIS in terms of the underlying data each seek. So we approach the linkage through this lens. With that being said, this is what our initial linkage between IRIS and the SDGs looks like in practice. Given that the SDGs are different than other IRIS linkages, we piloted an approach that differentiated direct metrics alignments from indirect alignments. Direct alignments are where SDG indicators and IRIS metrics align such that the underlying data required for each match one another. You can see on this slide what this looks like with the IRIS metrics aligned to the SDG indicators addressing occupational injuries and freedom of association in the workplace. Indirect alignments, on the other hand, are alignments where the underlying data between indicators do not match, but rather the suggested IRIS metrics could reasonably contribute to the SDG indicator and related target if certain intentions are met. For example, the SDG addressing the proportion of the population below the international poverty line does not connect to any IRIS metrics directly, but do connect if the clients of an organization are poor or very poor, as defined by the world development indicators, and the organization's goal is to move those clients out of poverty. We have included guidance on all aligned metrics in the full Excel file, which has been uploaded onto the IRIS website. Thank you, Adam, for context setting and highlighting the connection between IRIS metrics and the SDGs. Now we will have a presentation by Pete Klopp. Yeah, hello. Um, I hope everybody can hear me, um, and thanks for having me. Uh, I'm working here at PGGM, which is a pension fund, so it has a particular take perhaps on impact investing, and I'll briefly go through you know, the, the, the course that we followed over the past three or four years. Um, by five slides. So the first one um, has you know, the, the SDGs uh, in combination with the four themes that we originally picked. That was before the SDGs came along, we uh, settled on climate, water, food, and health as the four themes that we felt we could take on moving from managing our risk to creating more good, creating impact. And we picked those four themes because of either our fiduciary obligations, our fiduciary duty, climate, 
our capacity to really make a difference, water and food, and our identity. We serve the health industry, the healthcare sector here in the Netherlands, so health then becomes a logical choice. So we had just settled on those four themes and then the SDGs came along. So we were forced to map our four themes to the five SDGs that mostly uh, cover the same issues. So that's the first slide. And we really approach this from the perspective of an investor that wants to um, invest at scale, not in less bad, but really in more good. And the more good we defined, and that's the second slide, as um, impact through products and services that, in addition to that positive impact, also deliver a market rate financial return. And this is maybe uh, where we follow a different approach than, than most impact investors. And we, in fact, we try to avoid the word impact investor because what we cannot do, being a fiduciary, we cannot trade off financial return for the sake of impact. We need to have both. So the definition matters. It defines what we're looking for, market rate returns and positive impact, and we want to measure that positive impact. The next stop on our journey then is taxonomies. That word is used a lot these days, but we, we started it two, two years ago together with APG where we defined the solutions we were actually looking for in the SDGs for targeting. So these are products and services, mostly, organized in you know, nice hierarchies per SDG. Then we went on to mapping, mapping our existing investing portfolio in our case, that's 200 billion euros of investments across all sorts of asset classes, all the way from listed equity to infrastructure. And we map which of our existing investments actually do have a direct link to one or more of the SDGs. This is what we call alignment. Nothing's changed, really. We just classify our existing investments according to the SDGs. Once you've done that, you can account for, you know, the volume measured in euros in our case that can be linked to the SDGs. So we simply total up all the investments we have of which we think we can make a plausible case that they indeed do add value to either one of those SDGs. That's the fourth uh, bullet there. The fifth one, and here... It gets a little more t difficult. The fifth one is simply is, is something that, that PGM feels pretty strongly about. We think that in addition to mapping our portfolio, we should actually try to measure the actual impact that we make as an investor or that our investees, our companies and projects and other entities make on our behalf. Measuring tangible impact is something that is, is a pretty difficult thing to do, obviously. Um, it's a, it's, a, it's a young sport, at least for the sort of investor that we are. But we're quite deliberate and, 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 and uh, uh, determined to, to, to make a headway there because we do believe that the SDG uh, craze, if you may call it that, um, is at risk of falling victim perhaps to its own success, that it becomes a little too easy to declare everything SDG aligned. And many of the SDGs are rather broadly defined, so it becomes a little too easy indeed to call something an SDG investment. Hence our insistence on making or, or measuring the tangible impact, which, which really raises the bar. So if you go then to the third slide, or my third slide at least, um, that is the way we've organized the different investable solutions per SDG and we did to, so together with APG. And what we did by way of defining positive impact and measuring positive impact, um, interestingly, under the auspices of the Dutch Central Bank, uh, we ran a working group with 20 Dutch financials, and well, 17 financials and two Dutch uh, multinationals, and tried to make a selection of meaningful, investable, impact indicators from the date different databases that you've got, you know, GRI, IRIS, and a few others. So the whole idea here was that if indeed impact measurement is difficult, and it really is difficult, and there will only be so much energy and resources that mainstream investors will devote to this, 
given that they're fiduciaries in the first place. But if it's difficult, it's all the more important that we try to limit this to a handful of indicators per SDG that we can actually quantify. So what we did, we took a selection from those existing indicator databases uh, and narrowed it down to two, three, in some cases, four impact indicators per SDG. In so doing, we tried to define a kind of a core set of indicators. And of course, everybody is at liberty to add more impact indicators to that. But that is what we would like to know at a minimum when we declare something a sustainable development investment. It's not a tick-the-box kind of thing. It really is picking the most relevant impact indicator and trying to quantify that. Now, when you've gone through all that, you know, we did um, half a year ago, or a little more perhaps already, we did something that um, quite a few of you may have seen. Together with the Impact Management Project, we've tried to map the entire portfolio, so not just the 20 billion investing in solutions program tied to those four themes or the five SDGs, but really the entire 200 billion euro portfolio. We're mapping that according to the different um, columns and rows in this framework that the Impact Management Project put together. And you see that the biggest part of our efforts really sit in that column where we try to avoid harm. And we do so you know, through exclusions, through engagements, through ESG integration, at different levels. That's the rows in this column, in, in this framework. Beyond that, we have the accidental impacts, where we do benefit stakeholders, except that we don't quite know how much, perhaps, per stakeholder, and we haven't really identified the stakeholders. It is the sort of thing where we suspect we're doing good, but we don't quite know who's benefiting. And that is something that we're, we think we can, we can do in that last column, contribute to solutions. There we believe we can measure the contribution and we can identify the, the stakeholder group who's benefiting from this. So it goes from avoiding harm to accidental impact to deliberate impact. Um, it kind of is an eye-opener also to ourselves that you know uh, the bullets towards the right are rather small compared to the ones on the left. So there's a lot to play for here. Um, and that is something that we're trying to do with you know the slides that I presented before in narrowing down um, what constitutes impact, uh, narrowing down the, the, the themes, and indeed trying to be much more specific as to how a particular investment relates to an SDG so that you can claim, or perhaps not claim, that there is a deliberate effort there that indeed can be quantified in more ways than one, not just the direction, also the quantity, and indeed the beneficiary, the target group. So um, it's work in progress. Uh, I, I'll, I'll round it off right here. It's work in progress. I think what you see here is that once a mainstream investor tries its hand at impact investing, um, you do end up with all sorts of compromises. Uh, you lose some of the purity, perhaps, in the approaches that some of you may favor. What we do bring to this space, however, is scale. And um, we see a lot of what we're doing as, you know, incremental steps towards um, real impact, measuring real impact, and hopefully increasing real impact. But um, Rome wasn't built overnight, and we won't easily be there. We won't have that big, fat, red dot all the way to the right anytime soon. But uh, that's definitely where we want to see things moving. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Pete, for kind of walking us through your strategy and the impact management project uh, slide. That was really help helpful in context setting. So now we're eager to compare to the partners group with a presentation from Adam Helpler. Thanks, Mabinti. Um, and just a quick recap, for those who don't know much about Partners Group, we are a private markets investment manager based in Switzerland with about $75 billion in assets under management. Uh, we invest in private equity, private infrastructure, private real estate, and private credit. Uh, we're not newcomers to impact or to responsible investment more broadly. 
we were one of the first private market signatories to the UMPRI when we joined in 2008. And since then, we've made great efforts to stay ahead of best practice in what we all know is a very fast-moving space. We firmly believe that it's relatively easy to create a responsible investment policy, but much more meaningful and therefore much more difficult to demonstrate that it's actually being implemented. Uh, the IRIS team asked me to comment on the origins of uh, our PG Life strategy, which is our impact at scale strategy, and why we chose the SDGs as the guiding framework. Uh, one slide back. Uh, by early 2016, we'd accumulated a lot of experience improving the ESG performance of our portfolio companies in areas like energy management, health and safety, and employee diversity. In short, we knew how to generate positive environmental and social impacts by improving business practices. So then we naturally began to wonder whether we could put together a strategy that focused on a business's core products and services and how they could generate positive impacts. This coincided with a number of existing clients asking us to develop a strategy that offered market rate returns alongside impact, and members of our executive committee gained the conviction that Partners Group was the right firm to do this. Why the SDGs? Well, as Adam highlighted earlier, they represent consensus. They're the closest thing we have to a shared strategy to ensure a sustainable society and uh, economic system in 2030. Um, I also think the SDGs strike a really nice balance between being simple enough for a wide range of stakeholders to understand and robust enough to inform an actual investment strategy. Uh, as Pete mentioned, the danger of the SDGs is that that marketing kit is so user-friendly that it's very tempting to attach SDG squares to almost any activity with no objective authority to determine whether uh, something is or is not a quote-unquote SDG investment. Because of this dynamic, we wanted to build a strategy that was credible and pragmatic, built on common sense. Uh, next slide, please. The first task in developing the strategy was similar to what uh, our colleagues at PGGM did. We reviewed all of our direct investments since 2001 to evaluate whether we had a sufficient track record in SDG supportive investments to feed such a strategy on a go-forward basis. The result of this exercise was a resounding yes. We identified 91 transactions that met SDG criteria, with 43 of those taking place in the last four years, tallying to about $4.1 billion in investments. Aside from confirming that we have enough deal flow to support the strategy, this mapping exercise also helped us focus on those SDGs where we had the most experience and expertise. We've translated that into three broad categories for PG Life. Social investments in areas like education and medical care, environmental investments in areas like renewable energy and energy efficiency, and inclusive growth investments in areas like affordable housing and SME finance. Next slide, please. Up until this point, you could say that our approach was very similar to many others. We mapped our portfolio against the SDGs. Where we've spent considerable time and thought is on our impact methodology. In other words, as we see new investment opportunities come to our platform, how can we systematically evaluate them for alignment to the SDGs and for significance of their potential impact? The SDGs and the Impact Management Project's Shared Fundamentals Framework are excellent reference points, but as many of you have discovered, they're not that prescriptive. You need to bridge the theory to the practice. So we need to define an approach, and that's what you see here. For every deal that we evaluate for PG Life, we ask three key questions during due diligence. And I'll follow with a tangible example in the renewable energy space in a moment. First, what exactly is the connection between a company's core products and services and an SDG target? Second, how significant or deep is this impact? And third, how can we measure that impact? It's on the basis of these three questions that the PG Life Impact Committee casts a vote on whether a deal should be part of PG Life or not. If a company does become a part of PG Life, we've defined explicit steps to be taken during ownership to ensure that we're not simply screening for impact, but actively managing, measuring, and reporting to it. Next slide, please. So let's talk through an example. 
What you see here is a simplified illustration of how we draw the connection between a company's core products and services and SDG targets using what many of you know as a logic model. In this case, we've used the example of investment in a renewable energy platform. Starting from the left, you have the allocation of capital by partners group on behalf of our clients, which goes into the company as an input. This generates a couple of key outputs, the creation of solar and wind farms and energy storage facilities. These outputs lead to important outcomes for the environment the production of energy from clean sources, and a viable alternative to more polluting forms of energy production like coal. Finally, we tie these outcomes to specific SDG impacts at the target level, which you see in the rightmost column. As you can see, we look at both positive and negative potential impacts from a company's activities. Beware the impact investor who exclusively claims positive impacts. Next slide, please. I won't spend a lot of time on this slide because uh, I think many of you are familiar with the Impact Management Project. But once the link to an SDG target has been established, we need a way to think about the significance or depth of impact. And this is where we use the IMP's Shared Fundamentals Framework. We chose the IMP because we think it's the emerging industry consensus for how to evaluate impact. We also firmly believe that the IMP's work is going to help the full spectrum of impact investors better understand how their money generates impact. For each dimension, we've summarized here the key question we're trying to answer for a given investment through the lens of a specific SDG target. In this case, 7.2, which focuses on increasing the share of renewable energy in the global energy mix. Next slide, please. As I mentioned before, bridging theory and practice required us to make the IMP a bit more actionable. So for each of the focused SDGs that are part of the PG Life strategy, we've developed rating criteria on a scale of one to five, one connoting relatively less impact, five meaning more. This enables us to compare different perspective investments within a given SDG across the key dimensions of, of impact. For example, how important is this SDG to the country where the impacts will be generated? How significant of an impact will this particular investment make against that country's stated national goals? Will partners group's governance rights enable us to engage actively with the asset during ownership to ensure that impacts actually materialize? And really importantly, what are the risks that the business's business model could become divergent? meaning that their financial and impact goals could be at odds. Next slide, please. Finally, once you've established the link with an SDG target and evaluated the significance of impact, we also need to shortlist the impact metrics, uh, which we source both from IRIS and other industry standard sources that will accurately capture the company's impact. Uh, during our due diligence, we shortlist six to eight metrics with the expectation that once we've onboarded management, we'll actually narrow this to the three to five most important metrics that the company can credibly track, measure, and report. I'll pause there. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to share our PG Life strategy and look forward to discussing. Fantastic, thank you, Adam. There is a lot of content rich information here. And now that we have greater insight on PGGM and Partners Group, um, and I invite Adam to kind of kick off our Q&A uh, session. I know that you had a question for Pete about his strategy. Yeah, well, first I, I wanted to thank Pete and his team for their contribution to the, to the market. Uh, the taxonomies work you've done was very useful for, for Partners Group as we developed our strategy. Um, but relating to the comments you made earlier, I had, had one question. Um, measuring tangible impact, just wondering to what extent you have already engaged with external managers um, through whom you have to actually gather maybe new or different metrics uh, related to impact, and if you have, how have these sorts of conversations gone? Yeah, 
that's a good question. Um, um, you know, we uh, um, select new external managers on the very basis of their um, familiarity with these SDGs and with their, you know, sometimes uh, initial efforts at measuring impact, either in euros or in tangibles. And um, of course, it's very hard to draw the exact data that you'd like to know, even though we've narrowed it down to just three or five indicators per SDG. But once you have an external manager running a portfolio for you, um, and this wasn't part of the uh, arrangement from the very beginning, it's hard to kind of uh, reverse engineer that. So um, what we try to do is approximate the impact in some of the external mandates that uh, that we've got um, at a somewhat higher level, you know, not at the uh, individual company level, but at the sector level. We understand that this is, you know, very much, um, you know, suboptimal. But what it does, it helps us to at least discuss on the basis of an approximation what a better number, a better impact uh, quantification could be. So we use it for engagement purposes with those external managers as much as we do it with companies in which we invest. Again, few of those do these things already. So what you try to do is approximate as best as you can what that impact could be and then try to refine and, and, and specify that impact with the fund manager or, um, or the company. Got it. Thank you. Great. Fantastic. I know that we have a number of uh, questions that are coming in our, our chat function. Uh, a number of people are eager to get additional insight on what was shared today. So I'm going to start off with the, one of the first questions uh, to both Adam and Pete. It's around the issue of data availability. Uh, the question is, where do, where do you uh, acquire some of your impact data? How do you collect data. The frameworks are, are helpful. However, the challenge of data acquisition when measuring impact can be a challenge. Can you to speak to from your experiences to answer that question? Sure, maybe I can uh, kick this one off since, uh, since I asked Pete the question last time. Um, so maybe I, I think about it in two different phases of the investment process. There's during due diligence, when you're evaluating a company for potential impact, and then there's the ownership period where maybe you have a little bit more access to management. Uh, so during due diligence, you know, as a private markets investor uh, that, that tends to make um, control investments, we do have a good amount of access to information, uh, full data room access. We have access to management. And in that sense, uh, we can build a pretty robust impact thesis. Um, that said, you know, there's a lot of different kinds of information we're trying to gather when making investment. Uh, as you can imagine, lots of financial data as well. So there are examples where um, we don't have every bit of information that we would need to triangulate exactly what the impact is. And we have to do a bit of what Pete was describing as sort of triangulating impact. Uh, for example, let's say we invest in a, a smart metering company, a company that does smart energy and water metering. Um, we might have to take a sample size of energy and water savings that they've achieved and then extrapolate that for the broader platform. Um, but, you know, if we feel like we don't have a sufficient amount of data to actually make a, a call on whether the deal is impactful or enough, uh, then we have to factor that into whether we include it in PG life or not. During ownership, it's a bit of a different story. We have the luxury of control governance rights within the PG life strategy. So this is why that first onboarding conversation in the first 100 days of ownership is so critical. We share the impact thesis with the management team. Uh, we ask them if they agree. Uh, and then we confirm whether they have the systems in place to actually credibly track, measure, and report what their impacts are. Uh, and it's during that session that we have to identify are there any remedial measures we have to take to make sure that the following year when we come back to that company to gather this data, that they've had the systems in place to actually do that do that properly. And if I may add, um, you know what we've done for um, one asset class in particular, we run a, uh, a separate, actively managed uh, listed equity strategy um, with a mandate to an internal team here at 
PGM, an external team at UBS. And interestingly, these two teams have taken different approaches to, you know, trying to find impact where data simply are lacking. The UBS team has teamed up with Harvard, City University of New York, and Wageningen University, and tries to build models, essentially converting shares of revenue into impact. So revenue you can kind of break down into the different categories as, as small as possible, match those categories with the solutions we were looking for as per the taxonomies, and then find a conversion factor converting that revenue share, euros, to impact tons of carbon, liters of water, numbers of lives. They developed those models on, on deep dives. They've taken into particular companies and indeed uh, extended their findings, that conversion factor, to like companies. That's the top-down modeled approach, which is complemented or um, yeah, complemented by a bottom-up, more empirical approach that the internal team here at PGM has taken. They engage with companies and try to find impact with companies, which is a very slow process. So we have a fast-modeled approach with a more slow empirical approach. One feeds into another, though. Better empirical data feed into the model, ideally, and the model elicits better uh, impact data from the companies we invest in. Now, I, won't, I don't want to make this sound like it's all easy and, and quick. You know, it's not. But we believe that this is the way we can at least learn and build up the database that it is indeed lacking. I, I fully agree with whoever asked the question. You know, we've got framework galore, but the challenge really lies with impact data. We try to develop that database that way. Fantastic. Thank you, Adam and Pete, uh, to your response to that question. We have another question. To what extent do you find pushback from investee companies on the effort required to record and track the metrics? Adam, would you want to have a go at this? Uh, sure, sure, absolutely. So um, I guess uh, I guess my, my track record or my, my um, role as head of responsible investment has given me some experience in this space. So. Uh, before the PG Life strategy, we had just our overall ESG integration strategy where we needed to engage with all sorts of management teams uh, on identifying what ESG projects they were going to undertake to improve their, their performance. Um, frankly, um, the pushback has, has, has not been that uh, aggressive. Um, I think the worst you get is sort of like a more a... Um, you know, passive resistance or someone saying, hey, it's a very full agenda that, uh, that you're bringing to our company and this should be deprioritized. Uh, and in that sense, um, just like any other way that you're trying to interact with others, you have to figure out how to uh, find a way to get your objectives pushed through uh, someone else's. In the case of impact or, or the PG Life strategy, I think it's actually a great opportunity. And I want to pick up on what, what Pete was saying about impact at scale. Um, the kinds of companies and assets that we expect to go into PG Life are those who, as part of their value statement or as part of their mission statement, often explicitly talk about their impacts. For example, they'll say that as a healthcare company, we are committed to improving the quality of care for patients in a particular region. Or as an education company, we are committed to improving um, or educating the next uh, generation of leaders. And so, um, what we expect to happen is actually go to management teams and say, great, this is part of your uh, value statement or mission statement. We can give you the tools to actually make this much more real and to actually figure out if you are uh, achieving the, the, the mission and the values that you actually ascribe to. So while we haven't had many tough conversations to date, um, I'm optimistic that this uh, will not be a, a major, major issue. And I guess to balance the soft with the hard, uh, if that's the soft approach, the, this goes back to governance rights. Because we're a control investor, um, even if there's some resistance, we're in a position to make sure that those um, those impact objectives are, are met. Yeah. And again, if if I may add to this, you know, I think this is spot on, and 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 you very well articulated too. You know, th th there is something that we've learned that uh, companies actually do like to talk about this. Indeed, a very few have put the data around what they would like to communicate, which is in a way. Amazing, you know. You, 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 I'm kind of taken aback by 
um, that companies leave it to their marketing departments to tell these stories rather than uh, put a little more method around the madness perhaps and, and, and try to convey and, and, and um, more factual information around what they believe their positive impact is. Um, from our point of view, what is really key here is that we're trying to be selective, you know, um, asking too many things, whether it's on the risk side or on the opportunity impact side, is, is the kiss of death. You know, these companies are sick and tired of reporting uh, to all these different initiatives. So we really have to make sure we don't ask more than we really need. And what we really need is sometimes just, you know, a handful of data points rather than, you know, the full 169 targets that uh, the SDG menu gives us. Great, thank you so much. We have another question. This one is for Pete. Uh, could you comment on the largest percentage of the 200 billion euro portfolio being in the avoid harm category? How does risk management factor into the motivation for this part of the portfolio? Yeah, you know, it, it, that part of the portfolio is really where we um, are trying to, uh, to, to manage our financial or our reputational risks through, you know, the, the, the usual ESG instruments, right? Um, engagement, exclusions, ESG integration, mostly targeted at incorporating different externalities and our investment making process. This is where, you know, the bulk of our uh, passive investment sits. You know, there's 3,000 companies and 60 billion euros invested in a passive listed equities strategy. So um, all you can do really is try to avoid the worst, which we're doing in, 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 in different ways. Um, this is also where we come from, right? Um, the ESG effort by mainstream investors started from trying to do less bad, try to run fewer risks. So that's almost the default. We've moved up to the right. That is the more recent development. But traditionally, um, that's where the bulk of our, of our efforts is. And that's really indeed geared towards mitigating, managing um, social, environmental and governance risks in our portfolio. Fantastic. Thank you for that response. I think this question is both for Adam and Pete. What is a reasonable return on investment that the impact investors should expect? Should they be conditioned to expect low returns in exchange of the impact their investments create? Uh, I, I can I can comment briefly first. Um, you know, this I, I made this comment about the impact management project, and one reason why I'm excited about it, it's that it's trying to get all these different kinds of impact investors onto the same spectrum. We're talking about the same terminology, uh, and one natural outcome of that is that um, different impact investors can figure out what flavor is right for them. There, of course, are concessionary impact investors. Uh, there are some that actually you know, hardly expect anything but their capital uh, to be recovered. There are others that are saying, no, it's market rate return because we have certain fiduciary responsibilities. So uh, I, I wouldn't want to say that as a rule, an impact investor should expect um, lower return. It really is about what that particular impact investor wants to achieve with their impact investments. Yep. Yeah, and again, you know, um, for us, this is something that we simply can't, can't do, right? We can't trade off investment returns for impact. Um, and that's partly because, well, that's mostly because we run a mandatory pension fund. People have to enroll in our pension fund. There's nothing for them to choose. So we can't uh, play around with their money. Um, at least we can't do these trade-offs. So what we need to do, and very carefully need to do, is make sure that our investments do yield that market rate return in addition to a measurable social environmental impact. That also means that we are limited in how far we can push in that framework of the impact management project to the right and indeed in particular to the bottom right of that, that framework. Um, there's only so many uh, opportunities in deserving places that we can 
pursue expecting a market rate return. Um, this makes us not necessarily very popular, you know, which is why we try to to not define ourselves as impact investors. That that raises all the wrong expectations. We account for the positive impact we create, but we can't really manage for that impact. We can't manage for maximum impact, really, because that would then indeed force us to go to deserving places like uh, southern Sudan, where we simply can't find a market rate return. So we are really beholden to this overlap between financial and social return. Great. Thank you, Adam and Pete. There's another question about the interlinked, interlinked SDGs, for example, SDG 1 or SDG 17. Kind of how do you leverage, or what's been your experience, experience uh, leveraging interlinkages for effective implementation of investments in the SDGs? Have you, have you seen connections between multiple SDGs that you're, you've been able to measure and manage or see the value of measuring and managing those impacts? Uh, I'm happy to go first. I don't, uh, I don't want to keep taking the first crack of the question, Pete. I feel like I'm uh, <laughs> taking no, no, the please, team off feel the top. Free. Go ahead. Um, so it's a, it's a good question, and naturally there, of course, are overlaps. The world isn't organized by SDG target. Um, but to be, to be uh, candid, you know, in the first you know, several months of us uh, implementing this strategy, we actually try to uh, aim for simplicity. Um, you know, there's one corporate that, that will go unnamed that um, in their annual report listed out how they contribute to all 17 SDGs in different ways. Uh, a bit of a, a scattershot approach, and we said, no, why don't we make our impact thesis pretty clear and um, and focus on you know one maximum two SDG targets. Uh, so as part of our due diligence process, yes, we list out all the SDG targets that are relevant for a given company, but then we go through a process where we prioritize and we say yes, these are relevant, but where is the majority of the uh, potential positive and potential negative impact for a given deal? And then we really do a deep dive on that one that one target, maybe two, certainly not three, um, because I think then it kind of muddies the uh, impact thesis a bit. So uh, to answer the question briefly, I, I think there are natural linkages among different SDG targets, but we try to really focus on one or two so that we can keep the uh, the thesis and the delivery of the impact very clear. And we do the same. You know, we we try to um, to focus on just that handful of SDGs that we're targeting, um, we consider the other SDGs as uh, factors, externalities, so you wish, to take into account in the investment thesis. So we don't try to, uh, to sweep the bad news under the carpet here. There's obviously plenty of synergies and, and correlations amongst these SDGs, but the very fact that the SDGs are the success that they are, are that there are 17 neat little boxes. And that is something that works very well with at least the sort of investor that we are. So we don't want to make this overly complicated. Um, it's all right if we don't, if we're not comprehensive in capturing that impact, as long as we capture the bulk of it, and as long as we communicate the bulk of it. So um, we believe that complexity and comprehensiveness, in a way, are the kiss of death to impact investing. We really try to tie our investments to either one perhaps two SDGs, but not more than that. Other SDGs come into the investment thesis as things to be considered. So what we do force our managers is to come out with uh, an argument in favor of a particular link between the investment and an SDG, an argument that you know there's all sorts of risks associated with the investment, also risks in SDG terms. All things considered, we believe it's still worth doing. So it's a, it's a three-step, really. Um, that so far serves our purposes. It's a very qualitative way to go about this. But it, it helps to keep things rolling along. Um, otherwise, I'm afraid that we would quickly run into the sand because of the complexity that, that holistic or comprehensive analysis entails. Great. So, Pete and Adam, we have an, a question related to internal buy-in. Um, can you can you talk a bit about stakeholder engagement and socialization process 
that you underwent to get buy-in that has been necessary to enable them to now to enable you to, to implement sustainable investment strategies? I think it would be yeah. great to start with you, Pete. Yeah, I, this is really the question why we're even trying to do this, right? Because it certainly does make our lives more more complicated, also more interesting, but also more complicated. I think what drove the um, the pension funds that we serve to 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 take take this turn is that they really do want to contribute to a better world in which it's better enjoying a pension into, right? Um, they are pushed to do so though by a you know a, a crew of, of a motley crew of, of of stakeholders. You know, it's NGOs for sure. It's politics and parliament. It's uh, the general public. It's also interestingly the staff here at PGGM that you know finds this an interesting avenue to pursue because it adds value to you know what could be easily commoditized in <laughs> the financial industry um so straight up asset management um is a lot lot more interesting if you add a purpose to it so that that's what what all conspires to to going this route um now of course things become a whole lot easier if you don't concede either on investment returns or on the investment process, which is, again, something that we simply can't afford to do. So we have it both ways. So it's not that you have to convince people that um, th this is a strategy worth pursuing. What I think people need to be convinced of is that, indeed, you can have it both ways. There are investments, quite a few of them, that have a measurable social and environmental impact in addition to that market rate return. So it's more um, that we need to broaden our search, intensify our search, than that there is any fundamental disagreement or persuasion uh, required here. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And to give you a sense of our landscape, Partners Group is a roughly 1,100 person organization across 19 offices globally. So you're talking about change management, you're talking about stakeholder engagement. Um, you know, I put that somewhere between, you know, small enough to be really manageable um, and, you know, too large to be so unmanageable. It's uh, sort, of, sort of somewhere in the middle. I'd say, you know, one important part about um, driving this through is that you, of course, have to have some considerable uh, part of senior management, the executive level, that really believes in this and, and is willing to drive it. Uh, and the PG Life strategy, like many other strategic initiatives, actually has to have an executive committee sponsor. And that's the person really responsible for driving that level of the organization to make sure that um, they are driving the right consensus. Um, so we, we have that. Uh, we have um, not only people at the executive committee level, but also one of our three founders is passionate about impact, which certainly uh, didn't, didn't hurt in developing this strategy. Then there's sort of like a, you know, you might call the hard-nosed phase where, um, yes, it's a good idea, but can you really prove that this is viable and that it fits within our broader strategy? This shouldn't be an extracurricular activity or, or part of philanthropy. We have to do the normal things we would do for any investment strategy. And that includes the things that I talked about through the presentation, the mapping exercise, checking out our track record, uh, seeing whether we could build a really good impact methodology, and that wasn't short. That you know, I would call that a, a six-month. Uh, I don't want to call it a fire drill because it might you know give the sense that it was frenetic, but it was just sustained, intensive uh, effort to actually develop the the pillars of this strategy. Uh, and that was sort of to kind of give the confidence to the broader set of internal stakeholders that this was real uh, and and it could be executed. And then I think we benefited from some fairy dust, if you want to call it that, um, where as we began to socialize this strategy internally you began to observe a number of random employees at the firm raising their hands and saying, I'd like to get involved with this, um, which is uh, obviously music to the ears of any senior manager uh, in a firm to say, wow, we have something that actually enhances employee engagement, people are excited about, people can be proud of. And so I think with all those different elements, it became a pretty virtuous cycle uh, and momentum began to build and I guess that's uh, why we find ourselves in this conversation today. Fantastic. Uh, we have a, a question for Pete and Adam. Uh, so I'll, I'll ask for Pete to answer this question first. In assessing your um, SDG investment strategy, 
did you factor in the potential negative outcomes uh, that may occur if you had adopted this, or did it? How did you balance the negative and the positive outcomes of, a, of an SDG strategy? Yeah, um, that's a good question because you do open yourself up for all sorts of you know, criticism, constructive or otherwise. If you if you claim that you contribute to a, a better world, you know, as we call it here. Um, I think um, what ultimately drove this is what I just said, right? It's, it's you know, the, the, the external stakeholders, the internal stakeholders indeed too, but really that serving the healthcare sector means that you're serving people, 2.5 million in our case, that actually care about this stuff, that do want to know that their pension savings are being put to good use. So I think that ultimately is the bottom line, you know, that that drove this strategy and that kind of um, helps us to keep going even though, you know, again, nothing's easy here. For every positive impact that you claim, you can find someone who is ready to shoot holes in that, that it would have happened anyway or there's downsides to it or can you really attribute this to your decisions, your investment or your investee. So there's always that kind of discussion and you sometimes you wish, you know, you could live without all that. But um, we believe and fundament fundamentally believe that um, we need to reconnect the real or the financial world, the financial sector to the real world. Um, so f ideally for every one of our investments, we should be able to explain why we even want to make that investment. What is it good for? And that is, I think, almost like a philosophical drive underpinning all of this. It may not be shared by everyone here, but it is something that um, that is, I think, pretty close to the hearts of the beneficiaries that we serve. And of course, they do not directly have a voice in all of this, but they do have a board of trustees that oversees all of this. And I, I can briefly add by First of all, saying let me get the disappointing part of the answer out of the way. We don't have a formula where we say this is a plus six on the positive side and a negative three on the negative impact side. Therefore, we've got a three. Therefore, we're happy about it. Uh, I, I think it's difficult to to get down to that level of quantification and say here's exactly how things net out. Um, but I do think the first step is that we do need to be quite explicit and transparent about both the positive and the negative impacts and explore those and make them transparent. Uh, it doesn't serve anyone to live in a world where we only cherry pick the positive impacts of our investments. Um, I think, and I, this is what I'd like to see, that we move to a financial system where accounting for the positive and negative impacts becomes fairly routine, uh, that we have systematic ways of mapping this out, which stakeholders are experiencing which impacts, uh, and therefore can have more intelligent conversations about the holistic or you know, total impact of a given investment. And indeed, uh, even in the ESG world, uh, there are frameworks mostly being put up by the major uh, strategy consulting firms to think about total impact. So it's one area where I think the impact investing world is actually generating knowledge and lessons that we can then transfer back to the mainstream financial system uh, so that investors can have much more transparency into all the different kinds of impacts that their uh, investments generate. And, and if, I may, if I just may add to this, you know, I think one of the risks that you run is indeed, as Adam said, you know, that you're being seen as putting the sunny side up um, and, and sweeping all the risks and, and, and you know, negative impacts under the carpet. Um, we try not to do that. But at the same time, we think that, you know, we may have um, from the, you know, the origin of responsible investment, we've traditionally been better served on the negative side of things than on the positive side. So if we do err on the positive impact side, it is partly to to counter or to not to, to no, not, not to counter but, but to to complement the information we already had on all the negatives. Fantastic. Thank you, Pete and Adam. Uh, with that, we're going to have to conclude our webinar. We had a number of questions and remaining questions. Uh, for those who are interested in replaying this, this will be on our, our GIN website. 
Uh, we will also have the deck available for anyone who's interested in learning more, revisiting some of the key points and key messages shared by Pete and Adam. We thank you for uh, joining this first webinar on the SDGs, and we will continue to share information out to the GIN community. Uh, thank you for your time, and if you have further questions, you can certainly reach us at iris at thegin.org or visit us at www.iris.thegin.org slash metrics slash sets, as well as uh, visit PGGM, as well as Partners Group. Thank you, and that concludes our webinar for today. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.